Ja, gut.
Krishna, 
that where we are devotees come together to hear and chant my glories, I will be there. And since Krishna never steps a foot out of Vrindavan, wherever the devotees have come together for the Sankirtan, the sincere devotion, Krishna reveals Vrindavan wherever it may be. Just a few days ago, I was in Bombay. It was very hot, but very wonderful. And I was taking a flight to Moscow. So trying to see the positive I was thinking it would be nice and cool in Moscow. <laughs> and it was so cool. <laughs> when I arrived, it was 10 degrees below zero. <laughs> and it was several inches of snow and ice. And there was blizzards, massive snowstorms. Every day I was there. And I came to London, it was a sunny day. And someone said to me that I had brought the sun with me. <laughs> and I was grateful for the gracious words. <laughs> but whether we're in the snow of Moscow, or in the heat of Monday, or in the nice wherever we are, <laughs> If we're together with devotees, chanting Krishna's names, we are in truth in Vrindavan, in the spiritual world. <coughs> but we should know what that means. If we're envious of each other, if we have mundane ideas of competition with one another, if we don't like each other, but somehow or other we happen to be chanting together. That's not what Krishna is talking about. Manchitama kata prana bodhyanta parasa, kadhyanta shaman dityam tushanti chakramanti When we actually take pleasure being together, chanting and hearing the love of Krishna, and taking pleasure, that means there's love for each other. That means there's honor, there's respect for each other. When we come together in that spirit, Krishna manifests. Krishna manifests because he's pleased. Nothing mechanical alone is Krishna bound to. Nam Chintana Krishna's Chintani Ras Vigraha. Krishna is not different than his name. All of his qualities, all of his love and mercy, his eternal abode is all within the name. And that's a fact. Yegatanam Prabhupada Tamastitai Prajan. Krishna doesn't have to reveal anything in his name. He reveals when we're when he is pleased with us. And he tells us very clearly what pleases him. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he appeared, Krishna himself, in the mood of Sri Aadhar, in the role of a devotee just to teach us how to please Krishna. You may have your opinion of how to please Krishna. And I may have my opinion of how to please Krishna. And she and he and they and everyone else may have their opinions of how to please Krishna. But there's only one person who knows for sure how to please Krishna. And that's Krishna. <laughs> His feminine potency, who is not different from him, Sri Radha. She knows how to please Krishna. 
As long as we have any tinge of a hunka or false ego or separate desires from Krishna. And we need to go for sure. So Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells what pleases him. He tells Arjuna, you can understand this message because you are not envious. Envy does not please Krishna. To be envious of anyone is very displeasing to Krishna. There's a difference between a certain type of jealousy, which is kind of an honoring of person. I wish I had what this person had because this person is so wonderful. I'm not. But we're actually appreciating the person. That kind of jealousy based on positive appreciation and affection, that's a good thing. But envy is when we cannot tolerate somebody's virtue. I was speaking yesterday with Jani Tai Prabhu about a quote that I had recently seen. Where it is said that it takes a great person to, to sympathize, to sympathize with a person who's failed and who's suffering. But it takes a far greater person to be to have a positive outlook and sympathize with someone who is successful. When somebody's really failed and they're really beaten down, to feel compassion toward them is a great thing. But the real test, if a Vaishnavas, is if a person's excelling, if a person's successful, if this person's doing really well, if a person's doing better than us, better than me. And I appreciate that. That I have sympathy toward that person in the sense of affection. To envy somebody who's really, really beaten down is usually not there so much. So Krishna tells Arjuna, you can understand this message because you're not angry. In this one particular lecture I was listening to Srila Prabhupada, it's in the first verse of the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Dhritarastra is speaking. Karmakshetre kurukshetre samadera yagaksha. What did my sons do? And the sons of Pandu when they assembled on this field of Kurukshetra. And Srila Prabhupada is explaining about Dhritarashtra's son Duryodhana. He actually had so many good qualities. He was very handsome. He was a descendant of the Kuru dynasty. He was very powerful. He was a favorite student of Dronacharya. He was very honorable and respectful to his teacher, and he learned well. He was a tremendous fighter. He put up a really good fight against Bhima. A little later, he's extremely intelligent. He had only one disqualification. He was envious. And envy was like a fire that made all of his good qualities terrible. Not, it's well, 
his intelligence, his beauty, his high birth, whatever he had became extremely displeasing to Krishna because he had an envious attitude. It's like you can have a beautiful flower garden, flower forest, but a single spark of fire that's left unattended can burn it all to ashes. <coughs> Not only that, Duryodhana had an incredible personality. If we read the Mahabharata, Krishna Dharma Prabhu, his masterful, presented Ramayana and Mahabharata in so many beautiful scriptures in such an accessible and, and authentic way that's so completely in harmony with Srila Prabhupada and Mahabharata. It's a great art. Only an empowered soul could do such a thing. Thank you, Krishna Dharma. We read how some of the greatest people in the world took the side of Duryodhana because he really knew how to charm people. He really knew how to win hearts. But all these qualities became an artist, unwanted, because they were built on a foundation of envy. And in this lecture, Srila Prabhupada is telling that envy is the fundamental principle of material existence. The whole material world is built on envy. And he gave some explanation of envy. When somebody has something that you want and you can't tolerate that, that is envy. And one of the things that pleases the Lord Krishna most is when somebody has what we don't have and we appreciate it. We're happy for them. And even if they don't have what we don't have, or what we have, whatever, <laughs> even if they don't have what we think we don't, <laughs> even if we have more, <laughs> if we think that the person has more, and we're happy with that, Krishna really likes that. Because it's an expression of love. It's an expression of a well-wisher. Shri Prabhupada signed his letters, you are ever well-wisher. That means so many things. But we're supposed to follow in his footsteps. So in our little ways, the path of perfection is to learn how to be a well-wisher of everyone in their success or failure, in their happiness or distress, in their strength or weakness. An ever-well-wisher means a well-wisher in whatever situation we're in. That was Shiva Prabhupada, and he wanted us to also learn how to be well-wishers. That's the path of bhakti. So Krishna spoke these truths. In another place, he tells our Julie, you can understand this message because you are my friend and you are my devotee. And the whole Bhagavad Gita essentially teaches what it means to be a devotee. Culminates, manmana bhagavad bhakto madhyashim nandamaskara. Always think of me, become my devotee. Worship me, offer your homage to me. In this way you will come to me without fail. I promise you, 
speaks very emotionally. We chant at this beautiful prayer. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagat. Kopesha Kopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaste. When we chant out when this word hey, English, we say that too, but it's something very different. It's usually a very um, aggressive, hey. <laughs> no, it's not how you honorably approach your superiors. Hey. Hey, you. But in Sanskrit, hey, Krishna. He dad, he bruja de, he chalamite, he nanda suna kata. This is the six called swamis. He dad, he nanda suta. He Krishna karuna sin. It means calling out in a very humble, helpless state. He. This is what Draupadi cried when she was in her very, very desperate condition. When Dushasana, the envious Duryodhana's dear friend and colleague, was trying to humiliate her in front of so many people. Why? Why were they trying to humiliate Draupadi? What did she do? She was she was a nice lady. But for them, they didn't see Draupadi as Draupadi. They saw Draupadi as a way of totally demeaning, humiliating, and showing their ultimate superiority over the Pandavas. If we can't humiliate her, if we can put her in a completely shameless condition, then in such a devious way, we are shooting an arrow right into the very heart of the Pandavas to show them we have a superior position than you. That was their motivation. Worse than killing the Pandavas, is to kill their sense of a value. That was not only worse than death to Draupadi, it was worse than death to Yudhisthira, Bhima, Arjuna, Nakula, Sahadeva. Worse than killing them physically is what they wanted to do. It was the cruelest act imaginable. Shasana was pulling that sorry and nobody was willing to help. Duryodhana was so powerful. The Pandavas had already become like his slaves. They couldn't do anything. And the other people assembled, either they were so intimidated by Duryodhana, even everybody there knew this is a horrible thing to be done. But they were afraid. They were afraid of his power, afraid of his wrath. Or they wanted to have favors from him. And they didn't want to get in his bad side. No one did anything. And Dropadi not only to save the dignity of her own life but to save the dignity of her husbands as well. To save the very principle of dharma in the world. She threw her arms in the air and she cried, Hey Krishna, hey Govinda. That hey sometimes is translated as, Oh my dear. <laughs> In English, when we say, hey, you, it doesn't mean, oh, my dear, you. <laughs> oh, my dear. What does that mean? 
dear. Something very deep. It's calling out like a baby for a mother desperation. You are my only shelter. In the Pushkimar, they chant Shri Krishna Sharanam Mam. <coughs> Shri Krishna Sharanam Mam. The Krishna, you are my only shelter. And in this world, the tendency is to make the fallible soldiers our shelter. But only Krishna can ultimately help us. So this prayer begins, Hey Krishna, we're crying out to Krishna. You are my only shelter. This is not just a ritual. This is not just a song. This is not just a prayer. This is my urgent need. This is my focused, exclusive aspiration in life to find your shelter, Krishna. Hey, Krishna, Karuna said. Because he's an ocean of Karuna. Kindness. There are oceans in this world. Most of the planet is water oceans. But even the largest, the Pacific Ocean, it has so many boundaries. And if you go deep enough, you get to the bottom. But Karuna Sindhu, the ocean of Krishna's kindness, it has no shores and it has no bottom. It is unlimited. Infinite. And the most incredible thing about Krishna's love and Krishna's kindness is although it has no boundaries, it's utterly unlimited, it has no beginning, no end, it's ever increasing. How is that possible? If something has no boundaries, how could it increase? It's beyond intellect. It's beyond logic. We can accept it on the basis of some preliminary faith, but it's impossible to actually understand that unless, by Krishna's grace, we go beyond our intellect, beyond our logic, and he reveals it to us. So when we say, hey, Krishna, Kuru, Sunna, Krishna, you are an unlimited ocean of kindness, we have our conceptions. But as we make spiritual advancement, we realize deeper and deeper and deeper, and we become so totally humbled by that. You can't know God and have false ego, because God is so great. Feeling his presence makes, makes us totally young. And then there's the next part of that prayer. Dina Bandhu Jagatpati. This Dina Bandhu is very important. It means the friend of the fallen. Friend of the fallen. Sukha Dasaka Bhagavatana. Krishna is the best well wishing friend of all of the entities. But he especially reveals his friendship to the fallen. And Srila Prabhupada so nicely tells that a great devotee is not fallen, but feels fallen. That's also, you know, we could hear it and say, yes, that sounds so nice. But it's very inconceivable to be great and feel small, to be extremely moral, ethical, and spiritually enlightened and feel fallen. That can only happen by the grace of Krishna. 
when we actually feel ourselves fallen, then we can access Krishna. We were speaking with Chintamani Devi and Krishna Dhamma about Rupa and Sanatana Goswami earlier today. They were not fallen, but they felt themselves the most fallen. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami was living on the banks of Sri Radha Kund for years. He would spend three, four, five, six hours every day sitting listening to Raghunath Das Goswami tell the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Nityananda personally, physically appeared to Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami in order to go to Vrindavan. And the great estates of Vrindavan. At that time, there was Rupa Goswami, there was Sanatana Goswami, there was Gopal Bhakti Goswami, Jita Goswami, Lokanath Goswami, Bhugarbha Goswami, Rabhava Pandit, all these great, great, great acharyas and saints. They all unanimously decided among themselves. Krishna Skandaraj Goswami is the most qualified person to write the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya and his teachings for all time for the whole world. They knew what this book was going to be. It was the highest standard of the pure, authentic pastimes and teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And it was going to be the statement for the whole creation for all time. What a book. And they selected Krishna as Kaviraj Goswami. And the man was in his 90s in age. You know, you see people when they're in their 80s, they can kind of get around good, and they can remember people's names, and we think that's incredible. <laughs> compliment people when they're in their 80s, late 80s, and they, you, know, you can ask them something, and they, they can give you a good answer, they can remember things. That's pretty rare. Can you imagine asking somebody in their 90s to write Sri Chaitanya Chaitanya for the whole world, the most important literature? That was his position. The Paramahamsas considered him such a Paramahamsa. And yet, he's revealing his heart, totally, genuinely, and honestly. They can see him. He said, I'm, I'm so fallen that I'm lower than a worm. Where? Louder? <laughs> Sometimes my tendencies come out. <laughs> Lower than a worm in stool. Who could think like that? I remember one time I was doing some Ayurvedic treatment and one of those worms happened to um, appear from my body. And I was looking at him. <laughs> Thank you. He was, was a big, he was a pretty big one. <laughs> and what an exalted position to feel yourself lower than that guy. <laughs> Krishna asked Kaviraj Goswami was actually feeling that. You know, what was that one's intellect compared to mine? What was his abilities compared to mine? What was his physical features compared to mine? What was his lifespan? What was anything? What to speak of where he's living? <coughs> he says, I'm more sinful than Jaga and Manai. If anyone hears my name, they lose their piety. If anyone speaks my name, they become sinful. That's the way he's feeling. 
In one beautiful verse, he said, I am suffering from the disease of envy. In this condition, I'm falling at the feet of the great physician, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to save me. He's calling himself totally envious. He's putting it in writing for all time to come. And yet this is the man the greatest Paramahamsas have selected for this purpose. So in this context, Srila Prabhupada explains, great souls are not fallen. They don't act fallen. They're not fallen without or within, but they feel themselves fallen. That's a Mahatma. And a Duratma is just the opposite is actually very fallen, but yet thinks that I am superior to others. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is offering his own, his dandavat pranams, taking the dust from the feet of every devotee. He says, not only the great Paramahamsa Acharyas, but even the new devotee who's just coming to the path of bhakti, I take dust from his feet. And taking dust doesn't mean just the physical act. It means he's in his heart, hearts, he's honoring and worshiping. Dinabandra. When we actually feel ourselves falling, then we don't think we have the right to criticize or find faults with others. We may in a constructive way without any negativity of animosity, hate the disease but love the diseased. But the propensity of fault finding, criticizing, is simply false ego. Krishna's Dina Mandra. He's the friend of those who actually feel themselves fallen. And for those who actually are fallen, when they admit, when they accept that, that I am fallen, and take shelter of the Lord, then the Lord becomes the best well-wishing friend and lifts them up. That's the secret. So these principles are in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhakti, Tvamanya, Shakya, Aham, Hivam, Only by devotion can I can only be understood as I am. Only by pleasing Krishna. That is what devotion means. Sam Sivya Hari To please Krishna. Yet Kadoshi Rashnasi Yashtohoji Dadasya. Krishna tells all that you eat, all that you do, all the austerities you perform, all that you give away, everything, every word, thought, and deed should be to please me. That's bhakti. And Krishna is the authority of how to please Krishna. And he came in the role of a devotee. The ultimate supreme devotee, Sri Radharani, just to show by example how to please Krishna. And that's the special feature of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He did everything in such a way, and his devotees came to reveal those same truths so that we can understand it and we can follow in the footsteps. And one of the most important principles of Lord Chaitanya that we read in Sri Chaitanya Bhagavad, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, 
Yasu Tsu Shima Bhagavatam is the interrelationships of devotees. Devotees striving to help each other to become genuine. That's really what it's about. Whether we be, do gigantic big things with incredible results, or whether we just pick some flower petals and put them on the floor so that other devotees can step on them. We, there was a truck in front of us today. You may have seen this truck. This, uh, a van that was transporting flooring. And it said on it that we will make your feet smile. <laughs> How many of you saw that truck? I was very happy. I was, my feet were smiling just hearing <laughs> But that's kind of a Vaishnavi mood because we approach devotees, we approach the Lord and, you know, in the mood of service, which means we approach their feet and make their feet smile. And how does the flooring make the feet smile? To be underneath, right? If the floor is on top of the feet, the feet aren't going to smile. <laughs> They're under the feet. And feet has dust. They're under the dust. And because they're so nicely under the dust, they're not like they're not all rough and cutting. Very nice floor. Very smooth. Makes your feet smile. And they're meant to be like that. Taking such a humble position of service. We please the devotees. Service means to please. Service doesn't mean I'm going to take the dust of your feet even if it means I break your leg. <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen devotees trying to get dust from feet and breaking each other's legs. <laughs> Walking in crutches and gas because somebody took the dust of their feet. <laughs> Very that's not the spirit. <laughs> there's the form and there's the spirit. What gives the form substance is that we understand the spirit. So the association of devotees is we're all genuine, we're all trying to become, and we need the help of others, and we're trying to give help to others to become genuine. <laughs> Actual, genuine Vaishnavas. Authentic, real Vaishnavas, which means we're pleasing Krishna. If we're chanting 64 rounds or 3 lakhs of rounds, but we're arrogant and offensive to others, your chanting isn't pleasing Krishna. If you're doing kirtan, and you're weeping, and you're crying, and you're trying to attract other people to you, you're not pleasing Krishna. There'll be some effect, but it may take many lifetimes. But it doesn't really begin to happen in a very powerful way until the effect where you realize, I have to give this up. These ulterior motives. to appreciate what's genuine. <coughs> to appreciate character. Vaishnava character. And to really sincerely make that the goal of our life. The real success of my life is not just in the results of what I do, but it's in the character in which I'm striving for that result. 
because the intention and the character in which we strive to perform our service is the only thing that's really going to please Krishna. That is what Vaishnav community is. We see this in Sri Chaitanya Chaitanya. Or even if the devotees were having difficult times and Lord Chaitanya was chastising them, all the other devotees were there trying to somehow or other help that person. Incredible. Mahaprabhu was chastising out from here. And they're all, okay, you know, you have to go, but let's try to get something for you. <laughs> let's try to do something called Krishna Das Chota Haridas. Lord Shaitanya was using that as an example, but still the devotees honored that, that they were really trying to help each other. Because ultimately they were not envious. They were just following. The Lord could tolerate when we're fallen if we're sincerely trying to get ourselves back up. But envy and offensive toward other devotees, that's very difficult. Dina Vandu, if you feel yourself falling, you won't do that. You'll be very careful. These are principles that we must take very, very seriously if we actually want to make spiritual advancement, if we want to access Krishna's mercy, and, and if we want to actually create a society that will change the world. Shiva Prabhupada named our movement the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. It's very significant how he chose his words. And the context is quite inconceivable. Because he chose those words, at least they came out in a legal document that he had written at 26 Second Avenue, before practically anybody had come to this movement. There was, there was really not anybody at that time who was fully committed. There were people coming and just starting to learn and just you know, starting to eat some club joints. <laughs> just starting to get attracted to the channel. It's a little storefront. Beaten down, broken down little storefront. And none of the people had any money to pay the rent. Prabhupada had no money to pay the rent. And they didn't know if they would even have it the next month. And yet he establishes a trust, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Temples all over the world. So society, in this sense, society for Krishna Consciousness. That's a very deep message. We're not just a society. We're a society for Krishna consciousness. And what does Krishna consciousness mean? It's Lord Chaitanya's name. Chaitanya means consciousness. His name is Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Krishna consciousness. Our movement is named after Lord Chaitanya. It's practically a direct translation. But a society for Krishna consciousness, that means our whole society is centered around consciousness that Krishna is the supreme enjoyer, Krishna is the supreme proprietor, Krishna is the supreme friend and benefactor of 
everyone. The center and focus of a society means all of our interrelationships are based on this principle, focused on this. How to please Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya himself taught us. Ratiyatra is where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifests to the highest ecstasies of Radha's love for Krishna in Vrindavan. Where after years of deep Lamba Seva separation, Radharani is bringing Krishna back to Vrajpani. That's his mood in Vrindavan. She's seeing Krishna after so many long years. But before revealing the highest inner truths of, of Ras, he shows how we approach one of his first prayers when he sees Jagannath, the humble prayer of Chandra, the Tirtha, the Vaishnava, Shruta. I'm not a Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishnava, Shruta, or a Brahmachari, Vihasta, Vana, Krasu, Sanyas, Gopi, Bhartur, Kadakamali, Ora, Das, Das. I am the servant of the servant of your servants. Unless we deeply establish that spirit in our hearts, then all our philosophy and all of the science of the intricate technicalities of Rasik Bhakti, they cannot go beyond our brain. Their academic, their academic theoretical knowledge, they cannot possibly touch our hearts. Unless we do not abuse each other. Unless we're humble, tolerant, and forgiving. Unless we offer all respects to others and not demand it for ourselves. And the next verse, Nadanam Nadanam Basundari, Abhidam Pata Kadisha Kamele, Mama Janmani Janmani Shri Bhavata Bhakti Rohi Diki Pani. We don't want anything for our own selfish interests. We just want to serve unconditionally. That's what Gopi Bhattur Padakamale or Das Das Anandas means. While we're learning our philosophies, while we're chanting our rounds, all of these things, we understand the real substance that makes these essential spiritual practices pleasing to Krishna is our focusing and striving on becoming the servant of the servant of the servant. and develop their actual Vaishnava character. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was very graphic when he wanted to make a point. He said, the prestige of this world, you should see it as the dung of a boar. No, I don't want to bore you. <laughs> This is a very important statement. Because we are so attached, we are so much lusting and craving for prestige. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasanti tells us, see it as the dung of a boar. Have any of you ever studied the dung of a boar? Well, on your behalf, I have. Because <laughs> it's one of my very kind of crazy tendencies. <laughs> when I hear an analogy, I really want to study you know, what, is, what is the substance of it. How can I be this obviously you're supposed to be disgusted by the dumb How can you really be disgusted unless you see it? You smell it. You taste it. <laughs> didn't go that far. <laughs> I did the first two. And what can I say? <laughs> A 
we're seeing in the conditioned state, we're seeing prestige, false pride and prestige as lotus flowers. But the Bhagavatam explains that this kind of lotus flower, is like a bee that wants to drink from that lotus flower, but then the lotus flower closes and the bee can't get out. The bee is imprisoned, is suffering, and dies inside this beautiful lotus flower. That's the way the temptations of this world work. They attract us and they destroy our spiritual culture. So when we understand these principles with sincerity, when we really focus on putting Krishna in the center of our lives, what is the most important thing we were discussing this last night? The higher principle in every situation is what pleases Krishna. Because naturally, according to our perspective of situations, different people think they're right about something. And unless it's really a serious, obvious philosophical deviation, we feel, I'm right, you're, but in the process of fighting and the animosity it creates, the whole basis and purpose of our society is ruined. Because we're trying to prove that I'm right. You can be right on a, on a lower level and totally wrong on a higher level. If a person goes through the green light after robbing a bank, and the police come and pick him up and say, I didn't go through any red lights, the light was red green. He did something so much worse, but he did something right too. So we shouldn't be like that. We're just to prove that we're right. We do something so wrong. We offend people. We create disunity. We destroy the culture. Society for Krishna conscious, we really have to, to be sincere. What pleases Krishna? The prophet said you should you could show your love for me by how you cooperate with each other. That's a bold statement for people living in Kali Yuga. Lord Jesus, that universal principle, one of his last lessons to his disciples was he went to wash their feet with his own clothes. And one of his disciples said, Master, I cannot let you do this. And he said, I must, if, I must show you this. That if I'm your servant like that, if I'm the servant of each of you, then how you should be servants of each other. In Prabhupada, right? He talked about lesson again and again in an incredible way. Whatever he did was to serve us. He was the supreme master because he felt himself the servant. And I remember him, I was sitting like I was just a little pseudo sadhu in Vrindavan, sitting at Prabhupada's feet when someone asked him. Are you the guru of the world? <coughs> tears in his eyes. He looked down in the ground in silence for several seconds. And he looked up and he said, I am everyone's servant. That's 
that's all. He didn't say anything after that. That was the end of the auction. And how did he do that? He was everyone's servant. He said he gave buckets of blood for every devotee. So if we understand Prabhupada's spirit, if we really love Prabhupada, then how should we interact with each other? A higher principle. When we have that spirit, and he sincerely strived to attentively chant the holy names. Sincerely strive to hear Anikatan by reading Prabhupada's books, by coming to lectures, by listening to tapes, by absorbing ourselves and hearing and chanting. And by taking that power and potency that we're gaining from hearing and chanting into Seva or performing service. That's the sure path of perfection if we do it with an attitude that pleases Krishna. We shouldn't spend the whole day cooking an offering and then forgetting to offer it to Krishna. Yes. We spend all day cooking, 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 cooking for Gaur Purima, and then you sit down and eat it all, and then remember, oh, I forgot to offer. It's a very stupid kind of example, but we're usually pretty stupid. Sometimes we strive to do things. But are we offering it in such a way that pleases Krishna? So these are some of my thoughts. And I believe they're the mentor system is developing here in England. Greatly appreciate if all of you participate in that. Is there any questions? Who would like to be first? Question. Would you like to read through the room, or should I read one? You are the MC. <laughs> <laughs> we will do whatever you decide. <laughs> First question. Yesterday you mentioned we must be happy with others' happiness and success and feel their distress more than our own. How do we do this if we're naturally envious? <laughs> That's the beginning, asking that question. In this material world, Everyone is naturally envious because that's material nature, it's envy. But we want to transform material nature to spiritual nature. The soul is not naturally envious. The mind is naturally envious when it's conditioned. So we want to transform the mind. Chaitu Dharapana Marajan Bhagavad Bhakti Nirvana. 
pure, loving soul is looking at itself through the mirror that's covered with the dust of envy, then it, it seems very natural that we're envious. But the process of Krishna consciousness is to cleanse the envy, the arrogance, the lust, the anger, the greed that's covering the mind. And the first principle is we identify an anartha as an anartha. This is Lord Chaitanya's instruction to us through Rupa Goswami. He gives the analogy that a devotee is a gardener. Brahmanda Pramite Kona Bhagyavanti Guru Krishna Prasadi Bhai Bhakti Latami. And after wandering through the universes and the universes and the universes, a living entity is very fortunate when it comes in contact with the Guru and the seed of bhakti awakens in the heart. That bhakti lata page is so rare. That inclination for loving devotional service to Krishna is so rare. And that seed begins just to sprout. We have to be very careful. Lord Chaitanya teaches us. There's just a few slokas, but they're so crucial to our spiritual progress. We must protect the seed and we must nourish the seed. The nourishing is through hearing and chanting. We can't just think that if we're in the mode of goodness, that's enough. Protecting the seed more or less means very much being in the mode of goodness. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, no need eating. In and of themselves, they're not spiritual. They're the mode of goodness. Because there are animals and follow the fairly little principles. And I know stalwart atheists who follow the four regular principles. Very strictly. But when we when we live in the mode of goodness and from that place we pour the nourishment of bhakti, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Then that seed of devotion grows without serious impediments. Or let us say, despite all impediments, it will keep growing. So it is crucial that we regularly chant the names of Krishna. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada asks us to take these vows for no other reason than out of love and compassion to us, because it's the medicine. Emechi Arshadi Maya Nashi Parulaki Harina Mahamantra Dabhava Tumimani Lord Chaitanya would call out, I have brought the medicine for this age of Kali, for all the ills of ignorance and greed and envy and lust and pride and all of these things, and that is Harina Mahamantra. It's the most powerful, effective medicine if taken properly. And hearing about the Lord, Sravanam Kirtan, and that's the, the root, the basis of our bhakti is properly hearing. Srila Prabhupada told us that his guru, he said several times that I have noted this boy. He likes to hear. He said that about Sri Prabhupada. We should like to hear about Krishna. We should be very serious about chanting. But at the same time, Lord Chaitanya explains, as the Bhakti Lata Beach, the seed of devotion is growing, many weeds will grow along with it. It's not maybe or if. The weeds will grow along with it. According to 
your question, they will grow naturally. And one of the most formidable, dangerous weeds is envy and greed, arrogance, lust, anger, illusion. These are weeds that grow along. And Lord Jaganya describes some of these weeds. One of the most dangerous of all weeds is the propensity to find faults with others. That is a serious weed. But the danger is those weeds sometimes disguise themselves to look identical to the seed of devotion. What happens when you want to water the seed of devotion and all the weeds look just like the seed of devotion? They all look the same. Then naturally, you water the weed. And Lord Chaitanya says, then the weed will choke the seed of devotion. <laughs> choke it. And while it's choking this little tender devotional propensity in our heart, <laughs> we're putting water in a weed to make it stronger and stronger and stronger. And what water is that? And we think we're making a spiritual advancement. So Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explains if we have good association with devotees and we have and we, and we're hearing properly, then and if we're sincere, then we'll understand that this weed of envy is a weed. And even though it's there and it's natural and all this other you know, conditions around it, we won't water it. We won't give in to it. How do we water the seed of greed and envy? That weed is crying out for nourishment. Find fault with this person. Hate this person. Do this. I need this. I want this. I must have this. And we're thinking that this is what I need for my spiritual life. But if you identify it, no, I will not give this to you. I will not act on your demand. I will act on Krishna's demand. I will chant the holy names and I will be the servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord and I'll nourish that desire, not the weed. So this is the secret. We must identify the weed of envy as a weed and we must understand its danger, and we must not nourish it. We must put the, the nourishment of our choices in life on what is favorable for devotion. Who asked that question? Way the back. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you. You have, you have babies. <laughs> Another question to emerge. How to know if sometimes something is due to our mistake? or it's Krishna's arrangement. I have to go if it's our mistake or Krishna's arrangement. <laughs> if we're sincere, and we know our teachings, we know our philosophy, becomes quite obvious. But we also re require the association of senior devotees to help us understand that if it's unclear. 
You see, it may not be Krishna's arrangement that we make a mistake. That's our free will. It's Krishna's arrangement to give us the free will to make a mistake. But we have to take responsibility for our mistakes. If we just, anything I do, we just say, this is just Krishna's arrangement. <laughs> And we're not going to make progress. It is indirectly Krishna's arrangement. He has given us free will. But in the free will, we are responsible for what we do and what we say. So if we make a mistake, the responsibility is mine. And Krishna's arrangement is, if we're sincere in responding to that situation, we have an opportunity to, to even learn and grow and make great spiritual advancements on how we respond to the mistakes we make, if we do it right. Jagai and Matai made many mistakes, but they made that conscious decision to rectify and take shelter, and their mistakes were transcended. So that's Krishna's arrangement. That whatever we've done in the past, whatever mistakes, if we are actually sincere with the right motivations and we take the right guidance, those mistakes could help me to learn great lessons and gain deep realizations and make much advancement. That's Krishna's arrangement. That we have that chance. Because we all make mistakes. Is there any other questions? Would anyone like to raise their hands? Or does everything go through Jaini Tai? <laughs> yes. He was speaking quite a bit about Shanta Krishna, and I was just wondering if you could give some words about how we can improve on Shanta Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam tells Srimadam Sukata Krishna Pundya Sravana Kirtana that when one develops a taste for hearing and chanting Krishna in the heart becomes very pleased and he himself eradicates the anarchists in the heart by his grace <clears throat> if we actually develop a real taste for hearing and chanting. And there is the verse, Nasta Prayishya Bhadrishya Nityam Bhagavati Sethi. <clears throat> In order to develop that taste for hearing and chanting, <clears throat> we must hear and chant regularly. Nasta Prayishya Bhadrishya Nityam Bhagavati we have to take it seriously. Not that we read Bhagavatam one day and then a month later we read another verse. We chant around one day, we chant 20 rounds another day, and then the next day we decide, I don't have time. Regular hearing and chanting. It's like medicine. If we take medicine regularly, it has the greatest effect. So that is important. That we commit ourselves to prioritize regularly hearing and chanting Saravana Kirtan with attention to absorb ourselves. And then there's another very important verse on this subject. Shushu Shoshanaganasya Vasudi Vakataruchi Syanmahat Sevaya Vipra Kundishya Vinatir. 
that even if we absorb ourselves with hearing and chanting on a regular basis, the actual higher taste comes when we do that along with rendering service to great souls. The Bhagavatam says, by rendering service to great souls, the taste for hearing and chanting awakens within our heart. That's seva. That means a genuine service attitude. Tadvidi pranipatina pari prashnena seva. When we approach a guru, we should be submissive, but we should also have a genuine service attitude. To serve means to please without ulterior motives. We should strive for that. So this is important. Krishna is pleased when they get a taste for hearing and chanting because a taste for hearing and chanting means we're developing love for him. And that love is by his grace. When he sees me taking it seriously, by doing it regularly, by absorbing ourselves in it, by being determined to do it properly, and by developing and practicing this service attitude to great souls. <coughs> in this verse, Syan Mahat it's it's not just service to God, it's service to great souls. <coughs> And we learned from someone like Krishna Das Kapiraj Goswami and even Prabhupada. They were seeing any devotee in good standing is a great soul too. Shri Prabhupada sometimes called his disciples Prabhu. Famous Vyas Puja here in Bhattan. <coughs> the year that Radha Gokulananda was installed, <coughs> the next day, Shiva Prabhupada was glorifying his devotees, their greatness. He was glorifying Pradyumana Prabhu because he helped so much. He says, Because of him, we have Sri Chaitanya Charitam. Arundhati, his wife, she has done because of her, you know, um, whatever editorial she was doing. He was praising with so much enthusiasm the greatness of these devotees. And he was doing it out of genuine appreciation, but also to teach us how we should learn to appreciate each other. And there's another thing. We may not think that all the devotees are Mahatseva, are great souls. But we know Srila Prabhupada is a really great soul. And Prabhupada wanted us to serve each other. He wanted us to take care of each other. He wanted us to, our examples, to inspire each other. So that's the way Prabhupada told us to serve him. If we jump over what he wants to serve him directly, we're not serving him at all. So, by serving great souls, that means serving Shiva Prabhupada, that means serving his order, which means serving and helping each other by creating such a society. By doing that, Krishna's pleased and gives us that, that taste for hearing and chanting. So all these things together. That's the process that Shema Bhagavatam is giving us. Does that answer your question? Tell you all. Yes. Questions that we know that um, um, devotee association are so very devotees, um, like um, Can you speak in microphone as I do not. And devotee association are one of the most important thing in our spiritual practice. But in our, on the other hand, um, to commit uh, Vishnara Aparat is um, will 
we try and our um, the critical of um, devotion also is compared. I I, I heard of like in some scripture like if we commit rational opera, you even like uh, compare as you bring us to hell. So um, for some cases, if some person who are very aggressive, who are very uh, easily uh, offend rational, so. To uh, for those person to have a um, rational association is better, or to avoid to commit rational or by avoid rational is better. Can, can you understand my question? I don't. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> my understanding of what you're asked is is if someone is really offensive to devotees. Is it better that he, that he or she does not associate with devotees? Is that your question? It's better that the person associates and doesn't make offenses. <laughs> Pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Reading it, you can just tell me the essence of what you're asking. Um, I suppose what I'm asking is um, what does it mean to be true to oneself as an aspiring devotee in Krishna consciousness? Because we, um, we, 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 we want, we're obviously trying to be devotees and we have spiritual desires, um, but we, we are mixed and I suppose I'm wondering how do we make decisions that are guided by Krishna but also grounded in self-awareness and self-honesty? <coughs> if we're humble, it's easy to be honest. Proud becomes quite difficult because false pride not only causes us to hide our shortcomings, but it also hides it from us when we're not even able to see it. <clears throat> so the idea is not to be great. The idea is to try to be genuine as devotees. So we can be honest. But it takes a strong society where we really have friends so that we can actually be honest. This, this happens and it's a great tragedy where we're honest with somebody and then people use our honesty in such a way to exploit us. So, you know, we have to 
be genuine friends with each other, to genuinely try to help each other. It doesn't necessarily mean keeping secrets about a person's abusive behavior. But it means actually trying to really help each other in a way that's favorable for each other's devotional service. Guilt is Krishna's grace if we use it properly. Guilt is not, there's nothing favorable about, about guilt if it makes us depressed, miserable, and causes us to give up. We can't get anywhere. If we're guilty for what we've done, that guilt should actually propel us in a positive way. I have done this, I was wrong, it was bad, and now I have to be motivated to correct it. And we should be grateful that we have the opportunity to correct it. We should feel shame for what we've done, but we should feel great hope and, and much gratitude for the opportunity we have to rectify it. to learn to be honest with ourselves and honest with others. To accept what is favorable for Krishna consciousness and to reject what is unfavorable. Does that answer your question? Not exactly, but that's... I don't really understand your question. <laughs> descends into this world again and again and again to teach us where real shelter is. Bhakti Vinod Tagore has told us, I have seen and considered all the 14 worlds and I have come to the conclusion that my only shelter, Krishna, is in your holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. His word. Yes. I was just wondering what um, what approach did Lord Dave and his associates take um, in trying to build up or help those devotees who've been chastised by Lord Dave and I'm slightly Intrigued by that. Which of Lord Chaitanya's devotees tried to help? The how, how, what approach did they take? You mentioned that there was points when um, both the chastised and other devotees tried to, in the community, tried to help them. One example is how Krishna Das left Lord Chaitanya's service to pursue illicit sex with these very, very um, demonic people. They bewildered him. They bewildered him and convinced him to leave Lord Chaitanya and join them to engage in illicit activities. Can you imagine? He was all alone as Lord Chaitanya's personal assistant, watching him performed his leelas in South India. Lord Chaitanya was trans. We read the pastimes of the Kona Brahman and Vasudeva was a leper. And we read about his incredible going on the roadsides and everybody who saw him, he would embrace and make him into pure ecstatic 
Bodhis, millions of people were becoming the Bodhis. In Sri Ranga, he was there for the discussions between Lord Chaitanya and Gopal Bhatta Goswami and Venkatapat. He was there when Lord Chaitanya was dancing in front of Balaji, Tirupati, and thousands of people were coming wherever he was and seeing him dancing and seeing him chanting. They were completely transformed and millions of people were becoming pure devotees. He was there when Lord Chaitanya was meeting with Ramananda Rai on the banks of the Godavari River. And still, he left the Lord for illicit sex and for, you know, living with criminals. And Lord Chaitanya dragged him back and saved him. He kept him with him for the rest of the South Indian tour. Lord Chaitanya literally physically grabbed him by the hair and brought him back and saved him. And he seriously repented, seriously rectified himself. But Lord Chaitanya to teach an example when they came back to Puri. He said to the devotees, he said, this man, this is what he has done. Now he can do anything he wants, but he cannot be with me anymore. I don't want to see him. He called Krishna also seriously repentant. He really rectified himself. But, oh, he broke his heart. He was being rejected. And the devotees understood that Lord Chaitanya is trying to teach a good lesson, which is very important, that we have to take responsibility for what we do. But then Nityananda Prabhu, Swarup Damodar Goswami, and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, the most confidential, senior, most associates of Lord Chaitanya, they were trying, they were trying to figure out a way of engaging him to be happy in Krishna consciousness even without being able to be near Lord Chaitanya. So they gave him all this prasad and said, go to Navadvip and give it to Adoitacharya and give it to Sachimata and you're the one who saw the South Indian pastimes so of all the devotees in Shantipur and Navadvip and Kumina Brahman, Srikanda and all these places. You can just tell them all the leaders of Lord Chaitanya and bring them this prasad and in this way, they kept him with devotees, they kept him engaged in devotional service. Because they loved him, they cared about him. They could have said, oh, well, Lord Chaitanya is saying this, he did this, out from here, you are not cast, I don't want to look at you, I don't want you to see you, I'll be contaminated. They didn't think like that. Because he was basically sincere. They were there for each other to help them. One of Prabhupada's God brothers once told me that he was a president of the temple during Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's time. And one Brahmachari had difficulty. And, but he wanted to come back. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was very strong. He said, no, you cannot come back. He was very strong. The person was strong. And then after he left, he called the president. He said, now you should take him back after I leave. He said, how can I take him back if you rejected him? You're the guru, I'm your disciple. How can I take him back if you reject him? He said, for the purpose of teaching him and the public I had to do. But he quoted the story of Kal Krishna. But even if a person is chastised by the Guru, the devotee should be there to help that person. That's the Guru's desire ultimately. Does that answer your question? Okay, there you go. Thank you, Krishna. Guru Maharaj. Uh, we only have the call until 10, so I think we have to stop questions. Uh, would you be willing to lead a kirtan for all of us to dance and chant?
Well, we can leave an hour and ten minute church time. But we also have croissant. Oh, croissant is very really important. <laughs> <laughs> Two more questions. <laughs> now that everyone heard that Prasad, <laughs> like a, everybody has become awake. <laughs> Anticipation. Propensities, and we have our. We have to understand what the propensity means. Devotees can really misuse that. It's my propensity to get angry. It's my propensity to hate you. It's my propensity to overeat. It's my propensity to oversleep. Yes. I need to have those propensities. <laughs> <laughs> so we have many conditioned propensities that we're supposed to overcome. But as far as our propensities for our occupation and our nature, the Barnashan system is there to help us. We have pro the, the actual propensity to be a Brahmin or Chakra relationship. You know, if a person has a propensity to be a brahmachari, they're not just struggling away somehow or other, I'm going to make it till I die somehow. Die in sapphire. <laughs> <laughs> be happy as a brahmachari. If you're not happy as a brahmachari, I mean, if you're struggling, you should be happy with the struggle. You should be enthusiastic about the struggle. If you're getting overly depressed and lonely and just got to do it because... Then that's not... It's damaging. You could be very psychologically and socially damaging to try to do something that's really against your propensity. Your propensity is... You feel some joy in what you're doing. You know, a businessman, they get joy in making money, doing all that business stuff. <laughs> I, I found a wanted me to do that. So it just wasn't my purpose. <laughs> but when I in Bombay we have, you know, we have doctors and they're actually they're into it, they're absorbed in it. They're like, I just have to be a doctor. <laughs> They love doing their medicine work. We have brahmacharis who are preachers, they love doing it. 
They're happy doing it. We have, you know, workers. You know, you put them in a classroom and they're... <laughs> But, you know, you give them some hard work and they're just productive and happy doing it. But, you know, we have our propensities and with the help of senior devotees and just searching our own heart, you know, we can engage in devotional service according to our propensities in a positive way. Does that answer your question? There you go. Many ladies, it's their propensity to be a mother. And you know, if they have a child and they do it in Krishna consciousness, bringing a child up in this world is, is an incredible form of devotional service if it's Krishna's in the center. They're just taking that propensity, not suppressing it, but utilizing it in a beautiful way. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much for a wonderful class. Maharaj, it was a wonderful class. Thank you. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, my question is regarding uh, the second point that you made, Maharaj. Can I see that notebook? <laughs> this is his question. <laughs> Can you all see this? Can you see this? Krishna Dharmaji, can you see this question? Amazing, amazing. This is the most systematic, scientific, Beautiful note keeping I think I've ever seen. It's like if a graphic artist were to with a like a ten million pound computer would have been taking notes, it couldn't have been so nice. <laughs> It's only possible by your grace. Huh? It's only, <laughs> it's only possible by your grace. And your wonderful if class. you saw the way I took the words, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Mark, my question is that how can we collectively uh, serve with the right intention and development of creation of character, but also strive to attain results for the pleasure of Guru, the devotees, Srila Prabhupada, and the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. Mm. That's what Gita is about. Krishna tells our Guru to fight and to try to win with all of his powers, with all of his intelligence, with all of his determination with all of his physical prowess as a fighter. He's saying, he, he doesn't just say fight. He says, fight to win. The Bhagavad Gita could be just three words. Fight to win. But the 700 verses are to teach us how to try to fight to win. What is the character that we must, what is it? philosophical understanding, what is the motivation, and what is the character in which we fight to win. Whether you win or not is not important. That, that you fight to win with the right intention, the right understanding philosophically, and with a full heart and abilities, and especially our character, that's the victory. 
It's maintaining that philosophical and character integrity that's the actual victory. That's the message of the kingdom. So we have to balance the two. We can't just think that I don't have to accomplish anything, I don't have to work hard because I have good character. See, the Prabhupada was very strong that devotees should really work hard. They should really endeavor. They should be challenged to do more. According to whatever. You know, the artist, he had he challenged them to paint. The writers, the editors, he challenged them. You know, you heard that whole story of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, when he wanted it done in just a few months. 17 volumes. He challenged that. He challenged the book distributors. He challenged the pujaris. He challenged the teachers. He challenged everybody so that they would really be enthusiastic to try to do something wonderful for Krishna. But at the same time, in every lecture, in all of his books, he's teaching us the character and the philosophical basis in which we must persevere. And the combination of the two is bhakti. Srila Prabhupada, in one lecture I remember he was emphasizing how we must be enthusiastic. He said, if you're not enthusiastic, you're a dead person. Bhakti is very much based on her enthusiasm. That's a devotee asks, what if I don't have love? She would go by explain if your enthusiasm is your expression of love on whatever level you are. You may not have prema bhakti, but if you're enthusiastic to please Krishna through your service, that's an expression of love from where you're at. So enthusiasm is so important. But enthusiasm has to be with patience. It has to be with a proper, proper attitude and a proper understanding. Hare. Thank you. So I think we should end here. And shall we have your time? I'm so happy to see all of you. Really good to Please dance.